What's up, everybody? This is going to be a lecture on the chapter 42 OB chapter. It is in the Nancy Caroline ninth edition, the newest textbook. Uh, understand that not only is this going to be, they're going to have exams in paramedic school on this, but also it's going to be on your national registry. And this is nothing like anything else in paramedic school. It's kind of like its own lane, its own section. So please pay attention to this. Uh, you will see this again, I promise you. Now, how I set up this lecture, I did erase several things, understand like anatomy and the difference between an ova and an ovum. And there's certain things uh, with anatomy that you're just going to have to study. You know, you're going to have to know it. So if you want to listen to me, uh, you could throw me on like a podcast while you're driving, whatever the case might be. Uh, let's jump into this. We're getting right into OB. First thing we got to talk about is some wording. Okay. Gravidity and parity, we call it gravita and para. Okay. And EMS. Gravidity means the number of times that a patient's been pregnant. So again, gravita, you might say something like a gravita of two. It means that the patient's been pregnant twice. It doesn't mean, though, that they have children, right? Parity does. So whenever we say a para of one, that means that they are a parent of one. Don't forget that terminology. I always say para parent, para parent. So let's say that somebody has a gravidity of three, but a para of one, it means that they lost two children um, or they could be pregnant with twins, right? And they just haven't been born yet, but they have one baby that's actually alive. Hopefully that makes sense. Premi gravida means that this is their first time being pregnant. Remember, premi means first. Uh, premi para, first time being a parent. Multi gravida, a woman who has two or more pregnancies. Okay. Multi para, you guessed it, woman who has two or more deliveries. Okay. Have actually had the children. Uh, grand multi para, a woman with five, more than five deliveries. And nulli para is a woman who's never delivered a child. Okay. Please know this terminology. I would recommend uh, uh, taking notes on that. Okay. Talking about transport decisions, and we're going to be getting into a lot of discussion on how to deliver the baby and some different steps to look at. But whenever we talk about transport decision, the first thing that I always want to mention to you as a student is where's this patient going? Can they just go to any hospital? The answer is no, they have to go to an OB facility, right? Not only that, are we going to be delivering en route? Are we gonna be delivering on scene? We're gonna be discussing some of that today and I will give you guys the, um, the exacts. Like let's say that you're taking a test and it's saying, should I deliver on scene or should I leave? Don't worry, we're gonna talk about it. And here's some of those discussions. When do we need to do rapid transport? If there's any significant bleeding, right, and pain. Hemorrhage due to uh, pregnancy can be fatal. If a patient who has hypertension, we're going to talk about anything greater than 140 over 90. Uh, we're going to talk about patients who are seizing or AMS. Okay, If the patient starts to lose consciousness at any time, these patients are a load and go situation. Okay. But there are a lot of times that we will just stay in play on the pregnancy. If we see that pregnancy is imminent, not necessarily pregnancy, but the delivery is imminent, we're going to just stay in play. And how do we know that delivery is imminent? Not only did the water break, but we also note crowning. Okay. So there might be some different questions that we need to ask to make this decision. One of them had to do with some of the keywords that we discussed earlier. Is this patient a multi-para, right? Has this patient had multiple children or multi-gravita, right? Did this patient already deliver a lot of children? Because if so, then the likelihood of her delivering quickly, which we're going to talk about later, is very high. If this is her first time delivering a baby, then this might be delayed. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, the delay. 
anything technically greater than 30 minutes of on-scene time and no delivery, we should be transporting. If it's less than and delivery is imminent, we can stay in play, we can set up shop and we can start working. But if it starts to get delayed and we're just sitting around waiting, there's a good chance you're going to be here waiting a while. Make a decision. Let's take a look at some of these questions that we need to ask. I like to memorize these because whenever I have a patient that is pregnant and delivering, I want to know what to ask, right? So the first one, determine previous complications or any G, uh, gynecological problems. In gynecological problems. Ma'am, have you had any uh, issues in the past with a previous complication to delivery? Maybe you've had preeclampsia, maybe you're eclamptic, maybe you had gestational diabetes, maybe you had a C-section in the past. Is there any issues with previous pregnancies? And are there any issues with your current pregnancy? So with that being said, what do we need to say? Are you seeing a OBGYN? Are you seeing a doctor? When was the last time you went? Was everything normal, right? Was an ultrasound done recently? Determine general impression of the patient's health, right? How does my patient present? Does she appear to be in pain? Uh, and is she foregoing with any information about this pregnancy? Determine if there's any vaginal bleeding. Uh, typically, we'll ask, is there any spotting, right? Lam, have you been, uh, have you noticed any hemorrhage? What's the color of it? Is it painful? Different things of that sort. Determine if, the pay, if, if her water broke, okay? Maybe that there was, um, you could say, hey, maybe you, you felt like it got really wet and you didn't push or you weren't urinating. Uh, did anything like that happen? Especially if it's their first time, sometimes it uh, comes in a surprise. And then talking about her bowels, okay? That's another discussion. When women are in their final trimester, and it's time, right, to deliver, they're gonna have the urge to push their bowels, right? They're gonna wanna urinate, they may wanna go number two. We don't allow that, okay? Do not say, okay, don't worry, go to the bathroom and we'll be out here, just let us know when you're done. Um, if they're near delivery, we're not allowing that, okay? Take a seat on the stretcher. I don't want there to be a mistake or any issues or complications to happen in the bathroom. Inspect the woman for crowning. Typically, they'll know. They'll be telling you that the baby's coming and that they're having contractions. Um, in that case, if they do hint at that, we need to inspect. Okay. So quick glance to see if there's any crowning. Um, if there is crowning, guess what? We're dropping here and we're playing, right? We're going to go ahead and deliver the child right there. Um some other questions that weren't mentioned on these slides were, are you taking any prenatal vitamins? Okay, are you taking any prenatals? Again, find out how many kids they had, if they had any abortions, if they've had, if they have any uh, miscarriages, things of that sort. We need to figure out uh, the full story with this uh, pregnancy. On our secondary assessment, it says uh, base the exam on the chief complaint, right? Is the, are they complaining of shortness of breath? Or are they complaining of abdominal pain? Or are they just complaining of the contractions themselves? Can we time out those contractions? When did it start? I'm going to set my timer. Okay. And as soon as it stops, I'm going to stop my timer. And I'm going to pay attention to that. It's really interesting when you watch somebody delivering a baby and it's like clockwork when we say, hey, every two minutes, the contractions are starting. And it's amazing how her body knows exactly the time and it keeps track. Pretty awesome to watch. Braxton Hicks. Braxton Hicks is just false contractions. Okay. Several times have I had patients that are in their third trimester, they start having contractions, they call 911. I show up. And it's a false alarm. It's okay. We're going to treat it as a legit, uh, you know, OB scenario. Put her on the stretcher. Uh, we're asking all our questions. And sometimes the baby just isn't coming out. It's just called a Braxton Hick contraction. It says every 10 to 20 minutes, they will have a contraction. Remember, when those contractions start to narrow, it's a sign that this baby's in route. 
Okay, we talked about an imminent delivery. Okay, and I know it says listen for fetal heart tones. A really good thing to have on your unit is a Doppler. It makes your life a lot easier with fetal heart tones. Uh, assess the woman's vital signs. Oh, another great question to ask is your due date. When's the date? How old is this baby? Right? What's the date? We should get a gestational age. Absolutely. If there's time to reach the hospital, place the patient on the left, lateral recumbent, which we're going to talk about. Remove the clothing that might obstruct the delivery and begin transport. If there is no time, try to find a private clean area. Allow any support persons to be present and dismiss any non-essential people. Yeah, sometimes it's hard. Uh, easier said than done sometimes, especially with family. Some family wants to be involved. Um, it's okay as long as the patient's fine with that. Remember, we'll make that decision. We need to know how many deliveries have you had and if we're suspecting this to be an imminent delivery. Can we deliver in the truck? Of course. Okay, so if you're not sure and you're like, ah, there's a good chance that this is going to take a while, you make the decision to go to the hospital and all of a sudden the baby starts coming out, we're okay. Okay, plan for that, train for that. You'll be all right. So if the delivery is imminent, it says notify hospital staff, provide an update on the status after the delivery, uh, perform the delivery. We're going to go over all the steps to get the baby out successfully. And then we'll call the hospital. We'll transport both patients, all that good stuff. If the delivery does not occur within 30 minutes or a complication occurs, this is when we provide rapid transport. Remember I said that 30 minute mark is important. Talking about some issues here. Uh, first one, substance use, okay, or abuse. There are women out there that aren't seeing OBGYNs. They're not taking prenatal vitamins, and they're using illicit drug use or drinking alcohol and things like this. Um, it's pretty awful to watch as a provider, but at the same time, it's our job to still transport her and manage or take care of the baby once delivered. Understand that it will potentially cause birth defects and even addiction problems for the child. Okay, so this is where things get interesting. So let's talk a little bit about somebody who uses substances a lot, right? So, so let, let's say that they're on opioids and they're constant using of opioids. Well, once that baby comes out, the baby is going to have a uh, dependence on opioids. So the baby will even have pinpoint pupils. We are not giving that child Narcan. I'm going to repeat that. We are not giving that baby Narcan. And the reason being is that baby will be put into what we call withdrawals. Okay. That child will go into withdrawals. And believe it or not, how the hospital manages these babies is they actually put them on an IV drip of morphine. Okay. And they'll wean these child off morphine over periods of time. That kid's going to be a NICU baby, um, and they're going to be managing so the kid doesn't go within withdrawals. We can't pause the withdrawals as paramedics. Now, this is a little bit different if it's a one-time use. Let's say that the mom is not an abuser, and let's say that she was in extreme pain, and for whatever reason, uh, maybe she was a, in a traumatic incident, and she was given fentanyl. And when the baby came out, the baby had a low respiratory rate, pinpoint pupils. It's okay to give that child Narcan. Okay, does that make sense? Somebody who is a opioid abuser, we do not treat with Narcan for the baby. But if it is a first time use, we can. All right. I said I was going to talk about this, placing the patient on the left side, left lateral recumbent. It's for supine hypotensive syndrome. Understand that if your patient lays on her back, the uterus at the third trimester after 20 weeks gestation is going to have enough weight to compress the inferior vena cava. And by doing so, it decreases preload to the heart. And if you decrease preload, what's going to happen to blood pressure? Blood pressure is going to drop. How do we fix this? Well. All we do is place the patient on their left side or we manually displace the abdomen to the left. 
By doing so, it relieves the pressure on the inferior vena cava, thus improving cardiac output. Okay, it says just place them on their left, uh, treat the underlying cause, blah, blah, blah. That's it. Talking about cardiac conditions, obviously mom can have a cardiac condition. The baby can have cardiac conditions. Obviously, we're going to talk about more baby care and neonatal resuscitation. Uh, this is more just about the OB portion. Uh, but yeah, there could be dysrhythmias that we need to pay attention to, rheumatic fever that can cause uh, issues with the heart. And again, these babies can be born with a congenital heart defect. So something we need to consider, like tetralogy of phallic, which you might see on exams near you. Okay, we'll talk about those another time. Peripartum cardiomyopathy. Let's break down that word. Peri means before, partum means delivery. Cardiomyopathy means a cardiac disease, right? So we have a before delivery cardiac disease. It says uncommon form of heart failure and be easily confused with preeclampsia. Peripartum cardiomyopathy. Let me move my big head here. Mm, help syndrome. We'll talk about that. So talking about hypertensive disorders and hypertension is an interesting one with pregnancy because guess what? There are some women that just are hypertensive. Okay, they're It's just normal for them. They normally have hypertension, so they're probably on medications and then they get closely monitored when they are pregnant. Uh, but some women develop hypertension during pregnancy. And this can be an issue. Remember, any hypertension by definition is anything that is greater than 140 over 90. Now, please don't think that, oh, my patient hit 142 systolic. I'm going to go ahead and treat this. That's not the case. Um, we need to pay very close attention and we won't start worrying too much about that blood pressure. I know uh, the, this textbook in particular states anything greater than 165 on the systolic and greater than 110 on the diastolic. But again, blood pressure considered high, anything greater than 140 over 90. Um, so again, gestational hypertension saying that, hey, it's the, the OB or the pregnancy itself is causing the hypertension. This occurs after 20 weeks. For those of you who are taking notes, please write that down because that's so important. Um, 20th week, you're gonna see that has there's a lot of different things that start to occur after the 20th week. And take a look at this little graph. It says uh, from one side, it's well controlled, chronic hypertension. So that means they're on meds, whatever, it's normal for them. Then it starts to get a little iffy once it's gestational hypertension. It's, hey, listen, this OB is causing this. We're going to have to start monitoring it, start treating it. Then the patient comes preeclamptic. We're going to talk about the symptoms of that. And if that doesn't get fixed, this patient's going to have something called a HELP syndrome or even eclampsia, which is seizures with pregnancy. So diving back into what is preeclampsia, you have to know this, uh, extremely important. It's any blood pressure that is greater than 140, systolic, or anything greater than 90 uh, on the diastolic. Remember, that's considered high blood pressure with pregnancy over 20 weeks. Patient's going to have a low platelet count, um, which is seen in HELPS syndrome. Patient's going to have a renal insufficiency, so issues with their kidneys. Impaired liver function, pulmonary edema, which is pretty drastic. Uh, the patient's going to have more like uh, dependent edema, so more maybe swelling in the legs. We'll notice um, uh, some edema in the extremities. Potential for cerebral symptoms, such as headaches, blurred vision, uh, and again, those visual symptoms. Again, now, talking about eclampsia, all that means is that the preeclampsia was not either managed appropriately or it got out of hand, it got bad, until so the patient actually has a seizure with that pregnancy. Several different risk factors. Uh, first pregnancy for a young age, younger than 20. Uh, advanced maternal age. So typically an advanced maternal age is anything greater than 35. Multiple pregnancies, hypertension already, uh, somebody with renal disease and even diabetes. Somebody with diabetes has a higher chance of having uh, preeclampsia. 
So getting into that help syndrome uh, and some other conditions that can accompany preeclampsia. This is why preeclampsia is so dangerous and scary uh, for women. Let's look at them. Uh, if not managed appropriately, it can cause liver and renal failure, cerebral hemorrhage, abrupto placenta, which is tear of the placenta is tearing from the uterine wall. And then the last one's help syndrome. I know I've said that several times. Let's take a look at it. Hemolysis, so the breakdown of red blood cells, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. Okay, so this patient's going to have to, is going to have to start, uh, will start to have uh, irregular lab work when they get their blood drawn. Called HELP syndrome. Seizures. We discussed that this is called eclampsia. With pregnancy, look what it says. Treatment is difficult because drugs may cause fetal distress. Hmm. When we talk about treatment for this, it, it says that mag sulfate is recommended. Now, you might say, well, Mike, what, what drugs will cause fetal distress? Um, could Versed cause fetal distress? Uh, potentially, right? Versed can cause a decrease in respiratory um, effort. Could potentially cause fetal distress if mom becomes hypoxic, things of that sort. So mag sulfate is the, the drug that's recommended. We can use a lot of drugs on pregnant females, but there could be some negative complications associated with them. So mag sulfate is the best. And remember, even though mag sulfate is just an electrolyte, understand that mag sulfate does have properties of smooth muscle relaxation, and that is what's assisting with that seizure. Okay, again, abrupto placenta comes up, hemorrhage, um, DIC, death. There's some serious complications with seizures. Diabetes. Uh, diabetes is a, an interesting topic um, with pregnancy. It's okay for diabetics to get pregnant. It's okay for diabetics to have children. Uh, Typically, there aren't many issues. Understand that, yeah, can once she becomes pregnant, and do you think her sugars are going to fluctuate maybe differently than normal? And the answer is absolutely. One interesting thing about diabetics is remember that child has a pancreas that is working, okay? And they're basically sharing blood. So her blood sugars might actually start to regulate and normalize. Uh, thanks to the baby, which is a very interesting concept. Just make sure we're always assessing the BGLs if uh, mom is diabetic. Respiratory disorder, shortness of breath, or general dyspnea is one of the most common complaints. Why do you think? It says hormone-related changes absolutely can cause that. Also, how about the size of the uterus? The uterus starts to move up and up and up. And what happens is that diaphragm and abdominal organs get pushed up as well. And when that happens, obviously, it's going to lessen the space in which the lungs can fully expand. So the, depending on the size of that uterus, the mother's just going to have more shallow respirations. It's just going to happen. So expect, expect to see some shortness of breath. Hyperemesis gravidrum, definitely a, a, um, a subject that needs to be discussed, seen it on exams, and us as paramedics uh, should know how to treat this, even though it's a little bit different than uh, what you might expect. Okay, so hyperemesis gravidrum, persistent nausea and vomiting, a lot of people call this uh, morning sickness. Some women have it really, really bad, okay? It says here, severe persistent vomiting, projectile vomiting, severe nausea, right? Pallor and even jaundice, which is, that'd be pretty wild. So let's take a look at what we're allowed to give. So start a line and give Benadryl, diphenhydramine, IV or IM, okay? First treatment, Benadryl. And we can also consider Ondansterone, which is Zofran, right? Same dose. So two different meds. I know the one that you probably were expecting was the Zofran. Uh, not the diphenhydramine, but yeah, make sure we're giving Benadryl to these patients. 
some renal disorders understand that the renal system starts to change. Obviously, that uterine, that uterus gets large, starts to move things around. Look what it states here. It says um, the ureters get longer. Okay, so the ureters actually start to stretch, and it says that this can increase the chance of a UTI. So something we need to consider for these patients, increasing the chance of having an infection. HIV. Some women who have HIV understand that they can uh, pass it on to the baby. Okay, so a lot of the times they'll do uh, C-sections or they'll have some sort of plan with their OB to uh, protect the child. Cholestasis. It says bile is not flowing normally. Okay, bile is not flowing normally. It can build up in the liver and then spill into the bloodstream. Wow. That can be definitely problematic. Right upper quadrant pain. This sounds like a great test question um, saying that the uh, pregnant female has right upper quadrant pain um, and a fever. What is going on? Cholestasis. Torch syndrome. Okay, torch syndrome. These are infections that pass through placenta to the fetus. So again, infections that pl that pass from the placenta to the fetus. Let's talk about them. First one, toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis, great name. Um, this one is an interesting one because it involves kitty litter. Okay, handling eating contaminated foods or handling kitty litter. Okay, so women that are pregnant cannot um, get close to a litter box. Uh, if they have a cat, it's okay that they have a cat. They just got to make sure that they're not managing that that litter box because they can get this infection that can cause some issues with the child. Cytomegalovirus or CMV, it says that this is uh, very similar to herpes, okay, herpes simplex. And just like herpes simplex, if they have a breakout and having a vaginal delivery, there is a chance of spreading that um that virus to the baby okay it says newborns with cmv are more like more prone to having lung problems blood problems liver problems swollen glands rashes poor weight gain some serious complications with torch syndrome okay what were some of those other ones rubella other agents again herpes simplex um different infections that these small kids can have. Okay, talking about abortion. Abortion, or spontaneous miscarriage, is an expulsion of the fetus before the 20th week of gestation. For those of you note-takers, again, that 20-week gestation just got brought up. Spontaneous abortion occurs before the 20th uh, week. Understand that most spontaneous abortions occur in the first trimester. So if I'm reading a test question and they're telling me a, a weak gestation, I'm paying very close attention to that week because if it is before the 20th week, and especially in the first trimester, it is a high likelihood of being a spontaneous miscarriage. If it is after, right, um, typically it's from a complication, right, and or could also be elective, which I've seen. Uh, elective can also be occurring before the 20th week, should be occurring before the 20th week. This is when the mother decides that she doesn't want the child and she's going to an elect an abortion. And hopefully seek assistance with that. Habitual abortions, uh, by definition, means three or more consecutive miscarriages. Could be from a lot of different issues, ovarian issues, uterine malformation, cervical conditions, an infection. There's a lot of different reasons why someone might have a habitual miscarriage. A threatened abortion, abortion attempting to take place. Uh, it says characterized by vaginal bleeding in the first half of the pregnancy. Patients may present with an abdominal discomfort or report menstrual cramps. So she says that they're spotting or irregular bleeding. Immediately, we're considering that this could be a potential for a, uh, a miscarriage, and we're rushing that patient to the OB facility. 
an imminent abortion, spontaneous abortion that cannot be prevented, um, severe abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding. Uh, and sometimes this does occur in the 911 system where we have a patient that already had the abortion. Um, and they didn't know what was going on. They just had abdominal pain and they didn't want to call 911 or anything until the abortion occurs and then they call. So. Says treatment for this, IV, supplemental oxygen. The, the, the biggest thing is signs of shock. We're making sure that we maintain vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate, and emotional support. You got to understand that this is very challenging for that mother, and we need to be there for them. Okay. An incomplete abortion. This is pretty brutal. This is parts or products of conception, meaning uh, it could be a limb. It could be a, any part of the fetus coming out um, by itself. Understand that this can cause massive trauma, not only mentally, but also physically. It can cause bleeding. So just be mindful of that. We're going to manage again for signs of shock and, again, emotional support. The missed abortion. Fetus dies during the first 20 weeks, but then remains in utero. Okay. Um, again, we're transporting. Sometimes the mom knows she'll say something like, oh, the baby stopped kicking or I, I, something's wrong. You know, we'll take their word for it. Let's go, uh, take them to the hospital. And all we can do is provide emotional support and just make sure we continuously reassess and ensure that there's no bleeding. A septic abortion, you might have already guessed it, high fevers. Um, this patient's going to have be warm to the touch, and it could be, there might be potential for swelling or um, inflammation. Establish uh, an IV, abnormal saline. Again, uh, provide emotional support, obviously, to this patient, but fluid administration is a big one if we're considering sepsis. Remember, septic shock, all the blood vessels are vasodilating and that blood pressure or cardiac output can be reduced. So we need to kind of fill up the, uh, the vascularity of fluid. Careful with giving too much fluid. Uh, always check those lung sounds. You do not want to cause pulmonary edema. Third trimester bleeding, greatest danger of hemorrhage. Third trimester hemorrhaging can be scary okay we're going to talk about a couple of them the first one we always 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 consider the second that you hear of somebody with abdominal pain that is of pregnancy age this could be a female that's any can be anywhere from 10 years old to you know in her 40s if i hear abdominal pain I'm immediately thinking that this is a potential for an ectopic pregnancy. All ectopic means is that the ovum, the fur, the egg, implants somewhere else. It's supposed to be inside the uterus. It's just somewhere else. I know your head probably goes to the, the photo inside your textbook of that, uh, that fetus growing inside the fallopian tube. Could be in a fallopian tube, could be outside the uterus, could be somewhere else that's in ectopic pregnancy. Okay, this causes severe abdominal pain and can actually cause massive hemorrhaging. Okay, ectopic pregnancies. Abrupto placenta. Abrupto placenta just means that the uterus is literally tearing from the uterine wall. Okay, tearing from the wall and it's causing dark red, painful bleeding. I'm going to repeat that. Abrupto placenta causes dark red. Painful bleeding. Signs of shock, tender abdomen, rigid uterus. Not good. These women, these women can bleed out. Next one, placenta previa. Previa is an interesting one just because it's the placenta growing on the wrong side of the uterus. Okay? It's literally covering the cervix. And... It'll cause very light, but bright red, painless bleeding. My question to you is, is this an emergency? The answer to that is it's 
an emergency if mom is delivering, right? If that placenta is covering the cervix, that baby's got nowhere to go. The baby needs to drop into the cervix and through the vagina. And if it can't make it there because the, the placenta is in the way, this is now an emergency. So if they catch it very early and there's a little bit of light bleeding, again, no pain associated with this, um, they will they'll fix it in the hospital. Okay. But it's up to mom to, to call for help or to seek assistance with that. couple things when we talk about uh, bleeding, different signs and symptoms. Obviously, does the patient have pain? Is there any orthostatic vital sign changes? Remember, that's change in vital signs with position. Could be uh, mom is laying, let's say, left lateral recumbent in bed. We get a blood pressure, a heart rate. We ask her to sit up. And then when we ask her to sit up, her vital signs, her blood pressure drops and her heart rate goes up. It's a bad sign. That's called a positive orthostatic vital sign. Um, Gray Turner, Holland sign. Gray Turner, remember, is uh, bruising in the flanks. Holland sign is bruising around the umbilicus. Bad sign for internal hemorrhage. Saying, what, what can we do about it? Always keep that patient left lateral recumbent. Vi transport, oxygen, IV with saline. Uh, loosely place trauma pads over the vagina. Remember, we don't put anything inside to control bleeding. Loosely place on the outside to collect blood. That is all we're doing. Um, we haven't talked postpartum yet. Okay, So all of that bleeding that we just discussed was uh, during pregnancy. Remember, postpartum just means after the delivery occurred. We'll talk about that here soon. First, we got to talk about the delivery itself. Stages of labor, write these down. I've seen them asked so many different ways in exams. The first stage begins with the onset of labor pains, okay? Contractions. Lasts until the cervix is fully dilated. Uh, rupture of the amniotic sac near the end of the stage. Remember, if the test question says is, what is the end of the first stage of labor? The answer is the cervix is fully dilated. Second stage, the head descends into the birth canal, okay? Fetus will undergo several positional changes for the delivery, hopefully. Contractions are more intense, more frequent. Cervix becomes fully dilated, and it will conclude when the newborn is delivered. Again, second stage ends when the baby's out. The baby's not in the, and not in the womb anymore, not in the cervix right? The baby is out. So the third stage, placenta is expelled. Uterine contractions squeeze and shut off blood vessels, okay? Hemorrhaging should cease in the third stage, at the end of third stage. This little chart here tells you the time limits that each one should take, depending if it's her first time or she's had multiple children. So interesting to take a look at. But um, yeah, please know the stages. I promise you, you're going to see them again. Not going to get too much into how mom's vital signs are going to change. Just understand that obviously mom has a baby in her, right? There's going to be a, um, a response to vital signs. And here it's showing the maternal response is mom's response She's going to have an increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure, respiratory rate. I'm expecting to see these things. She's in labor, right? Says the fetal response, uh, decrease the amount of oxygen and nutrients, insufficient removal of waste. So the baby is getting ready to basically switch from placenta-driven life to the outside world. Let's get into delivery, right? Birthing position, a lot of different ones. I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of different birthing positions. Probably the most common that you're going to see is the supine birthing position, especially in EMS, right? We get somebody on our stretcher, they're laying, you know, they're semi fowlers. We can lay them back supine. I'm not going to have her stand up in the back of the truck. Okay. Um, typically, you're going to see something like a uh, standing birth or a kneeling birth. You'll see these kind of birthing positions with like a midwife at home, typically not in the field. 
But the other one, semi Fowler, side lying and lying supine position can occur. Here's a couple photos of them. I like the chair use here. Well done. Okay, we'll talk about um, why kneeling is probably a good one for certain situations. I always tell this to, to paramedic students uh, and to new hires. Know what's inside this kit. Know what's inside your OB kit. Open it up. If you've never seen it, just open it. Go through everything. Make sure that the first time that you're delivering a baby, you're not scrambling and you have no idea what's inside that box. Okay, it says this uh, safe control delivery takes uh, precedence over the draping. So, of course, we want to sterilize the environment. We want to make sure that we have a nice location for it. I want to go back to that photo. Look, uh, look what they did here with uh, the drapes over her legs to try to sterilize it. They even put a drape or a sheet under her, her butt, right? That's correct. We want to do all that stuff. But understand that safety of the, pre of the delivery takes precedence if it's coming out like right now. Have your partner at the woman's head to help keep her calm. Administer oxygen. Encourage the woman to rest between contraction and resist bearing down. We want her to bear down during the contraction. Control the delivery. Support the head as it emerges. Always sweep a finger around the neck for something that we call a nuchal cord. A nuchal cord just means that uh, umbilical cord is wrapped around the neck. And that's something that can cause some serious problems for us. Once the head is delivered, this is when we can start our suction. Please do not wait till the baby's fully out to suction. As soon as the head comes out, we can make that decision. Okay, I would have somebody already holding the bulb syringe, press the bulb syringe. Remember, we always do mouth, then nose. And the reason why I put up my fingers like this, we have one mouth, we have Two nostrils. Which one comes first? The mouth. Then the nostrils. Why do we do that? The reason why we do it is once you suction the nose of the baby, the baby is stimulated to breathe. We do not want them to breathe if they have amniotic fluid uh, or any other mucus, anything like that around their mouth. We don't want them to aspirate. So we always suction the nose last. Gently guide the head downward. The reason why we're doing this is because we are trying to get a shoulder out. Okay. When the baby comes down through the cervix, they will go ahead and turn to where they are kind of like in a vertical. Shoulders are going to be at the top and bottom. Uh, and the baby should be coming out that way. Um, once we see that the baby is coming out with their head sideways, remember we gently pull down, gently to assist with one shoulder, and then we'll guide the other shoulder up and out. Once the shoulders are out, the baby's coming. Quick. Okay. Once delivered, maintain the newborn at the same level of the vagina. This is very important. If we place the baby too high above the vagina, then obviously, through gravity, blood is going to come out of the baby and go back into mom, towards the placenta. What's that going to cause? Anemia. We're going to lower the red blood cell count that's inside the baby. And if I take the baby and I place them too low underneath the vagina, what's going to happen? Gravity. Red blood cells are going to cascade down into the baby. Okay, we would call this polycythemia. Too much red blood cells. So be mindful. We want to keep it at the same height as the vagina during the delivery. Or post-delivery, I guess. White blood and mucus from the newborn's nose, mouth with sterile gauze. So right now, this is what we call dry, warm stimulate. Okay, dry, warm stimulate just means that we're going to take uh, sterile dressings, wipe down the baby. Um, it says we want to dry the entire body as best as we can. Okay, the reason why we do that is we don't want to promote hypothermia. Then we're going to go ahead and wrap them in some sort of uh, either a blanket or what we use. We call it bunting foil. Okay, it's it looks like aluminum foil, and you wrap that kid like a little uh, potato. Usually has a little hat thingy that you put on them uh, to keep all heat within the baby. 
<clears throat> says, uh, usually breathing on their own at this time, usually turning from blue to a normal baseline, but expect that expect there to be some cyanosis when the baby comes out. Record the time of birth on your patient care report. You guys were waiting for this. The APGAR score. All right, let's talk about it. APGAR scores have to happen at one minute after delivery and then at five minutes after delivery. Well, you might say, well, Mike, why can't I just do it immediately when the baby comes out? Well, we got stuff to do. We have one minute to perform things, right? Our one minute includes dry, warm, stimulate. Once we dry, warm, stimulate, suction, everything, we should be around a minute. We can start our first APGAR score, okay? I want someone performing an APGAR score, and I want somebody clamping and cutting. But we're going to get to the clamp and cut. Let's talk about APGAR. So the first, appearance. Appearance. Remember, APGAR can be either a zero, a one, or a two. In the appearance, if the child appears to be normal toned, uh, maybe pink, uh, just normal, they don't look cyanotic, we'll call this two points. If they have something called acrocyanosis. Acrocyanosis means that they have cyanotic extremities but they have a normal toned or it's a one if they're completely cyanotic they get a zero pulse anything greater than 100 is good we give them two points for that if it's less than 100 but they have a pulse it's one point if they have no pulse zero grimace this is, it says reflex irritability. So we actually need to perform some sort of stimulation. I might be able to take my fingers and flick the baby's feet. I'm looking for a prompt response. I'm looking for that child to move. If they move, guess what? They get a two. Let's say that it's very minimal or they're sluggish to move. I might give it a one. Let's say they don't move at all. It's a zero. Activity. This means that the child should be moving on their own without stimulation. The baby should still be moving. Okay. If they're active, moving around, we give that a two. If they have abnormal flexion, their arms stay flexed or their legs are flexed, it's just it's abnormal movement, we give that a one. If there's no movement at all, we give it a zero. Last, respirations. Vigorous cry. If the baby's wailing, I, we always say the crying baby is a good baby, right? If the baby's wailing, that means that she's breathing or he's breathing, we give it a two. It's minimal whimper or not much crying. It's that slow or irregular. Uh, we're going to give that a one. And if there's no crying at all, then we give it a zero. Okay. Please remember this. Um, one thing I always tell students is APGAR should be part of your data dump during your national registry. What that means is when you sit down to take your national, there should be several things that you write down. For example, a GCS, for example, an APGAR, for example, the rule of nines. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would recommend that you write down before you start the exam. Please know this. Memorize it. Next, talking about cutting the cord. It says tie or clamp the cord with two that are two inches apart. So what I recommend is four inches from baby. And then from that four inches that is our first clamp. And two inches from that clamp, we clamp. So one of the easiest ways to do it, take your hand, put it on top of the umbilical cord, and place your first clamp. I'm not telling you to pull out a damn measuring tape. Uh, but understand, four inches from baby, clamp, two inches from there, clamp. You're cutting right between. It says examine the ends once they're clamped and cut to ensure that there's no bleeding. If there is hemorrhage that's occurring from the clamps, your clamps aren't very good and you need to do something about it. Clamp, use another clamp. Once the cord is cut, uh, wrap the newborn in a dry blanket. You can see in this photo what they use. They use hemostats. I am a fan. Hemostats are awesome for clamping. Uh, the problem is, is the price of these are not very uh, efficient. So in most OB kits that you're going to get, you're going to get this little plastic clamp thing that's, it, it can do the job. 
just a little, they can be a little bit of a pain and they do break. So be, just be careful. Delivery of the placenta. Write this down. Placenta delivers within 30 minutes after delivery. 30 minutes. Please don't pull on the umbilical cord to speed this process up, even though you might see that in the hospital. We're not doing that. Instruct the patient to bear down. Remember, it's kind of like delivering another, you know, fetus. So we're going to have to bear down and that ba that placenta should be coming out. Remember, we're going to be bagging that placenta. It says the fetal side should be gray, shiny, and smooth, while the maternal side, the one that's on mom, uh, should be dark and have a rough texture to it. Place the placenta into a plastic bag. It says examine the parent the perineum for lacerations. Okay, that's the uh, space between the vagina and the anus. Sometimes, if the baby's too large, that area will tear, and we need to control with direct pressure. Um, if there's no tear, then obviously we don't have to. Prepare for transport. Postpartum care. Now we're going to start getting into a little bit more of that postpartum bleeding that I spoke about. Um, obviously it says obtain mother's vital signs. Cause guess what? Now we got two patients, uh, or more, right? Monitor the mother's condition closely, assess the fundus. Okay. That fundus is going to start to move down, uh, her abdomen. It says note lochia. Lochia is kind of like a mucus substance that, uh, will be on the baby. And you'll see, it could be like a whitish clear color. It says, cover the mother with blankets. Absolutely. We still have another patient to deal with, right? So it says premature. So some complications, other complications with the delivery. Uh, premature rupture of the membrane. Talking about the amniotic sac, that sac that the baby lives in, right? With amniotic fluid. If there's a premature rupture, it says labor should begin within 48 hours. If she's saying that her amniotic sac ruptured, she said her water broke. We're transporting. Do not allow her to sign a refusal. No, she's going to an OB facility. Preterm labor. Write this down. Labor that begins after the 20th week, but before 37 weeks. Anything before 37, but greater than 20 is considered preterm. What's the problem with preterm? Uh, the child's going to be very small, underdeveloped. It even said there, it says uh, the patient will be admitted to the hospital for medications, bed rest, and monitoring. They do not want babies to come out preterm. This is how babies end up in the NICU. Okay. A uterine rupture, the actual rupturing of the uterus inside the mother. Signs and symptoms, weakness, dizziness, thirst, initial strong contractions that have lessened. They'll have a sharp tearing pain. Look for signs of shock which you would expect with a tearing uterus that's inside the patient. Precipitous labor. We talked about this earlier. Labor that's coming quick, right? The entire labor time from birth is less than three hours with precipitous labor. Now, what do you think? What patients are these? This is going to be your patients that have multiple kids. Okay. My first delivery that I was ever a part of, she had, I want to say three kids. So this one was quick, fast, and in a hurry. Um, expect to see it. Post-term pregnancy. Write this down. Fetus has not been born after 42 weeks. 42 weeks. I'm expecting to like a normal delivery around 40 weeks. 42 weeks, anything greater than that is considered post-term. Now, what's the problem here? Guess what? The baby keeps growing. Every week that goes by, that kid gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now post-term, this child's so large that there could be some serious issues getting that child out. One big issue with post-term or postpartum uh, delivery, not postpartum, post-term delivery, I'm sorry, uh, is meconium. Now, meconium has gone through a lot of different discussions over the over the years. Uh, meconium is the first stool that this baby passes, 
Uh, it's kind of like a greenish substance. And if the baby is able to pass meconium into the amniotic fluid, then this could potentially cause an aspiration issue and an infection problem. Now, please note that meconium staining does not mean that you're going to innovate this kid. Okay. Meconium staining typically occurs if the fetus has distress, right? There's a fetal distress or something's occurring with a, with a child and they are able to pass that first, um, that first bowel movement that should happen outside of mom, right? But if it happens inside of mom and the delivery occurs, well, when that baby comes out, there could be meconium all over the baby's face. And if the meconium is inside the baby's mouth and the baby inhales, the baby then inhales the meconium or the stool inside their lungs, and it can cause an infection, can cause rails or crackles and shortness of breath. And then we have to perform something called deep tracheal suctioning. All bad stuff. Okay, all bad stuff. And definitely be a part of um, pneumonia, right, for that baby. So let's just quickly discuss how this gets managed. Again, you. Baby comes out, you note meconium staining on the baby. Um, maybe even before the baby comes out, you'll notice possible meconium staining around the vagina. Uh, you'll note that there might be meconium on the head when the baby's crowning. Prepare the equipment for innovation. Okay. We don't know what this baby's going to look like when the baby comes out. Baby comes out, remember suction, mouth, the nose, dry, warm, stimulate. This is going to dictate what we do next. If the baby is vigorous, meaning the baby's crying, the baby's moving, we do nothing. We monitor the baby. We make sure we clean with sterile dressings, make sure there's no meconium inside the baby's mouth. If the baby is non-vigorous, not moving, not crying, this baby's going to require intubation. Okay. Once the baby is intubated, we're going to use something called a meconium aspirator. It's a small piece of plastic that goes on top of the ET tube. We'll intubate the child, place the meconium aspirator on top of that ET tube, hook up that aspirator to our suction, and then fire it up. We're gonna, we're gonna use that ET tube as a whistle tip suction device inside the trachea, forming deep tracheal suctioning, get the meconium out, we take the ET tube out and discard it. Okay, you're not going to keep the main, the, that same ET tube in there. Um, hopefully, the baby will start breathing again on their own once we get the meconium out. If the baby doesn't, you might have to reintubate uh, with a clean tube and continue ventilations. We'll get into neonatal resuscitation and how that uh, how breathing for that kid's going to work with the next chapter. Fetal macrosomia. Macrosomia just means that the kid is a very large baby, right? Uh, again, post-term pregnancy, big kids, kids that are over 5,400 grams, around nine pounds. Um, yeah. It says treatment should focus on support and rapid transport. There is a chance that this is going to be a difficult delivery. Encourage breastfeeding. Check the newborn's blood glucose levels. If there are multiple gestation, uh, we're suspecting that there's multiple children. Prepare again for another delivery. Prepare for more than one resuscitation. Have more people there. You might have to consider calling for additional resources. We're going to consider this. If the belly was really big on the mom, but then the baby comes out and the baby's really small. Well, that didn't make sense. There's a potential for, for more. Right. Second newborn is usually born within 45 minutes. Says the procedure doesn't change. Check if there are one or two cords coming out of the placenta when it delivers. So it's possible that the placenta will deliver and there's still a cord attached to a baby inside of mom, which is pretty wild. Two cords is considered identical twins. One cord is fraternal twins. Uh, and two separate placentas. Okay, so one placenta could feed two children, or there could just be two placentas inside the mom. Hmm. It says record the time of birth for each newborn. One would be considered baby A, 
The other one would be baby B. An amniotic fluid embolism. Okay, I'm sure you've discussed pulmonary embolisms at some time. Understand that women who deliver are at higher risk of having a pulmonary embolism due to the amniotic fluid. Okay, it says amniotic fluid can enter the woman's pulmonary and circulatory system through the placenta. Could be problematic. So look for this respiratory distress, potential for hypotension, cyanosis, all this good stuff. Not much we're doing for that other than recognizing what it is and transporting. Olihydra hydraminos, okay? This just means that there's too much amniotic fluid. Too much fluid. It says usually will be detected early in the ultrasound. Um, they're at higher risk for a prolapse cord, abrupt placenta, postpartum hemorrhaging. Not good things. Okay, some things that we're going to be talking about. Oligo hydroaminos is too little bit of this amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is pretty important for that baby to develop. It says that we're not diagnosing that in the field. Follow pelvic disproportion. The head of the fetus is larger than the pelvis. It can be problematic for a little little uh, woman with a very big baby. It's going to be a hard time to get them out. Usually that child's going to require some sort of cesarean uh, section to get them out, not a vaginal delivery. So a couple different presentations that we're going to pay attention to. Uh, remember I said when the baby goes into the cervix, they should rotate. When the baby rotates, uh, it allows for the shoulders to come out. If the baby comes out with a cephalic presentation, this can be problematic. A cephalic presentation says a newborn's head is overly extended. So it's not coming out with the top of the baby's head. Instead, it's a brow presentation. You're seeing the baby's face during crowning. Not normal. Okay, can be uh, problematic. It says that the newborn's head cannot be externally rotated or delivery cannot be completed. Support the woman and the fetus and provide rapid transport. That can be scary. Breach presentation. A breach presentation is any part of the body besides the head is leading the way into the birth canal. That's considered a breach. As you can see, this kid's sitting in this like Indian style cross leg. Okay. Uh, if buttocks are presenting and delivery is imminent, position a woman with buttocks on the edge of the bed or stretcher. Okay. So kind of like off of the stretcher a little bit and then have her legs flexed. So we call it knees to chest. Allow the newborn's buttocks and trunk to deliver spontaneously. What does that mean? We're technically not supposed to reach our hands down and grab and pull anything like that. We're just assisting with bending of the legs and positioning mom in the most successful way to get that delivery to occur. Once the legs are clear from the from mom, then it says support the body to gently assist it out of the vagina. Do not, again, we're not tugging anything like that. We can cause trauma to the baby. It says you can lower the newborn slightly to assist. Once the hairline is spotted, grab the newborn's ankle, and then we're going to lift upwards to get the head out successfully and potentially the arms. If the head is not delivering within three minutes, the newborn can suffocate. So we got to do our best to try to assist with that uh, delivery. Scary. Never been a part of anything like this, but I have heard of people near me who have. Okay, a footling breach, also known as a limbed presentation. Not good. Okay, the problem is, is let's say that that baby's leg continues to come out. Well, what's going to happen to the other leg? Well, the other leg is going to start to go in the opposite direction as the baby is delivered. This could cause some serious trauma to that baby. We do not want to attempt a delivery of a limb presentation or a footling breach. We want to ask mom to pant. Do not push. Knees to chest and go. Shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is when that little baby's got Linebacker shoulders, 
and it's really challenging for the shoulders to pass through the vagina during the delivery. It says if the shoulders cannot clear, the birth canal, the fetus will not be able to breathe and they will suffocate. It can cause some ser uh, brachial nerve plexus damage. So it can cause some um, nerve damage to the baby uh, with a shoulder dystocia. So what, what happens and how we try to uh, improve the success rate of this baby delivering is something called a McRoberts maneuver. Uh, you can see that we got knees to chest going on, okay? Uh, and it says, apply pressure suprapubic above the pubic bone, right? Uh, and what you're doing is you're kind of sandwiching that baby's shoulders in to decrease the amount of circumference of the baby to fit through the, the vaginal opening uh, and get the baby out. It's called the McRoberts maneuver. Again, we discussed the nuchal cord earlier. It's a, I said it was the umbilical cord wrapped around the newborn's neck. Remember, we, we feel around with our finger. If you feel it, we get one shot at this. You go up and over. If there's still more cord wrapped around the baby, we're going to clamp, clamp, cut. Again, you get one shot at this. Stick your finger around the cord. Pull. Lift up and over the baby's head. And hopefully the baby's freed from the cord. If not, clamp, clamp. But we never cut the cord without clamping. That's how that baby will bleed out. Prolapse cord. One of probably the worst presentations you can see. The issue with a prolapse cord is that the umbilical cord will, get, will go through the vaginal opening first before the baby. And once the baby enters the birth canal, it'll start to apply pressure between mom and the baby. I'm sorry, mom and the umbilical cord. And what will happen is the umbilical cord will actually get shut off. The blood supply from the umbilical cord from the placenta to the baby will get clamped because of the pressure of the baby trying to deliver. Well, if we allow the baby to deliver, the baby will basically suffocate itself by putting all that pressure on the umbilical cord and not then receiving oxygenated blood. So. What do we do? Keep the woman supine with hips elevated, okay? Administer 100% oxygen. Have the woman pant with each contraction. Again, asking her to pant makes it so she doesn't, uh, she doesn't try to push. Gently push the presenting part back up into the vagina until it no longer presses on the cord. Now, which sounds com confusing, but I'm going to explain it. Let's say the cord's hanging out. The first thing I'm going to recommend you do is feel the cord. Take a gloved hand, place it on the cord. We should be able to feel a pulse. If I feel a pulse, it's a good sign, right? It means that there's still oxygenated blood going to the baby. Someone needs to be assessing that cord at all times. If the baby starts to pass into that birthing canal, which is going to happen, and they start to compress the cord, and we start to feel either that the cord starts to get weak, the pulse starts to get weak or absent, we actually need to stick our hand into the vaginal opening, into the birth canal, and push the baby off of the cord. So if the head of that baby starts to come down and presses on the cord, we need to put our hand up and push the baby off, maybe even away from the cord to allow that blood flow to occur. Now you might say, well, okay, well... Somebody sticks their hand in there. They start to relieve some of that pressure. Now the blood is starting to flow. Can I take my hand out? No. You're stuck the whole time. Until that baby goes into the operating room, you or your hand will be trapped. Okay? Because you're holding the baby off of the cord until they actually expel or get the baby out. Pretty terrible. Does maintain pressure while another paramedic covers the exposed cord with a dressing, a moist sterile dressing. Okay, anything that's coming out like that, always going to be a moist sterile dressing because it's an organ, right? Maintain the position throughout the urgent transport. Trust me, you tell an OB facility that you're coming in with a prolapse cord, it's going to get a little hectic. Uterine inversion. Um, Pretty brutal. This means that the placenta fails to detach properly from the uterine wall and the uterus actually goes inside out. So the uterine, the uterus actually expels through the vaginal opening. 
backwards. Pretty terrible. Can cause massive hemorrhaging and even shock. For this, keep the patient re uh, recumbent in the same position. Uh, administer 100% oxygen. Start two large wire IVs. Do not attempt to remove the placenta if it's attached to the uterus. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to uh, replace or reattempt to put the uterus back into place. It states in your textbook that we get one chance at putting it back. Sounds crazy to me. But yes, that is, uh, if you saw that on the National Registry, it is in the textbook. You get one attempt to replace the uterus back into mom. Let's talk oxytocin though. Huh. But sorry, pitocin or oxytocin is a hormone that actually the woman uh, secretes. And what oxytocin does is it causes the uterus to contract. It's a normal function. And it's a medication that we can provide. We can give oxytocin 10 units IM. It's an IM injection that will allow the uterus to contract. Now, why would that be beneficial? Well, if I can add, make that uterus contract, it'll slow down hemorrhaging. So we're going to talk a little bit about postpartum hemorrhage. Average blood loss during delivery is 150 mLs. Sounds like a great test question. Average blood loss, 150 mLs. Blood loss with postpartum hemorrhage that exceeds 500 mLs during the first 24 hours after birth um, is bad. Postpartum hemorrhage, we do not want excessive bleeding. How do we manage postpartum hemorrhage? First one is uterine massage, right? So the fundus, remember that I said the fundus starts to drop as the baby's coming out, uh, will perform a fundal massage in a circular motion to assist with, with postpartum hemorrhage. Encourage the woman to breastfeed. Now you might say, well, what is that gonna do? Well, when the baby latches on mom, guess what it creates? Oxytocin. We just said it was a hormone that's going to cause the contraction of the uterus, right? Slow down hemorrhaging. Notify the receiving facility. Transport immediately. Large bore IVs. Remember, we never pack dressings into the vagina. We're going to place a dressing on the outside to collect. Skin to skin. Put the baby on mom. Allow the baby to latch. Fundal massage. 10 units of oxytocin. I am. This is how we stop postpartum hemorrhage. We spoke about a pulmonary embolism earlier. Uh, could be in the amniotic embolism, pregnancy-related venous thromboembolism, or even a water embolism. Those are things that can cause it. Um, some signs and symptoms that we'll see, sudden dyspnea. Typically, dyspnea that does not get better with oxygen administration uh, is a bad sign for a pulmonary embolism. Sudden onset of chest pain or abdominal pain, another bad sign. Okay. So pay attention for these things. Another thing that you might be able to see, and this is a little bit advanced, but for those of you who have done cardiology, you might see something called an S1, Q3, T3, okay? Prominent S wave uh, and lead one. That means that, remember, we have Q, R, S, but if we have a prominent S wave, that's in lead one. Next one, Q3, a prominent Q wave in lead three. And then T3 will have an inverted T wave. This is a sign of a pulmonary embolism on your EKG. So next, talking about postpartum depression. It says experienced by one in nine women. This is a real thing. It can appear up to one year after birth where um, the mother basically becomes very depressed. And sometimes they even don't take care of the infant. They, they choose not to. Um, and it's like a psychological thing that occurs after pregnancy. It says one in nine women will experience in this. Uh, anger towards the infant, no interest, thoughts of even harming either themselves or the baby. Now, with OB, we have to also discuss trauma, right? Because guess what? It is possible that you might run a car accident or a fall injury or something of this sort and the patient being a woman who is pregnant. Now, how is that going to change our treatment? Well, there's a couple things that do change. It says 
First and foremost, you got to know a little bit about what happens with the anatomy. Abdominal contents are compressed into the upper abdomen. So somebody who takes a um, maybe a hit from the seatbelt that's going across their chest, maybe this upper right side, depending on which seat where they're sitting in the car, could cause some organ issues, right? If you're a driver, it could be the liver. If it's a passenger, it could be a splenic rupture, things of that sort. It says the diaphragm will be elevated 1.5 inches. First trimester, it says uterus is well protected. Yeah, well, it's very early. The uterus isn't that large. Uh, second and third trimester, now the, the uterus extends into the abdomen and more vulnerable. It's going to be very difficult to interpret tachycardia with pregnant females because we're expecting to see what? Tachycardia. I'm expecting it. Normal. Pregnant females are tachycardic. It's going to be greater than 100. The signs of hypovolemia can be hidden. Why? Because there's excess of blood volume in, in pregnant females. They're made more blood volume to help not only her survive, but also the infant. Higher chance of bleeding to death in case of pelvic fractures. Inadequate respiratory rates, less than 20 breaths per minute. Remember, normal is 20, 12 to 20. But for pregnant females, I'm expecting to see normal being above 20. So if my respiratory rate starts to become shallow and drops below 20, that's a bad sign for these patients. Interesting here. It says, if a pregnant woman has a massive has massive bleeding, circulation will shunt blood away from the fetus. Please do not think that her body will save the fetus. Blood is going to be shunted away from her extremities and from the fetus to protect her. That's her body's job. Pretty interesting. Fetal heart rate is the best indication of fetal status um, in trauma. We call it fetal distress. Uh, fetal heart rate should be between 120 and 160. Anytime that it drops under 120, this is known as fetal distress. We'll talk more about that in uh, neonatal resuscitation. Uh, it says only treat the woman directly. Transport a pregnant woman on her left side if no spinal injury is suspected. So if you're going to place her on a backboard due to potential spinal cord immobilization, I know some a lot of departments are getting away from backboards, but it's still part of the, the curriculum. Okay, So if she's on a backboard, what are we doing? We're putting towels or blankets or pillows under the right side of the board. It's going to prop the board up and displace her abdomen to the left. We can also manually displace the abdomen. Take two hands, place it on her abdomen, and pull towards the left side. Okay. If you're going to assist ventilations when needed, provide a higher than usual minute volume to oxygenate both her and the fetus. Treat it just like any other trauma, though. It says start one to two uh, IVs, notify the hospital of the patient's status, keep them in that left lateral recumbent. There's that um, displacing the abdomen to the left. If we run into a cardiac arrest situation and we note that she's pregnant, we need to try our very best to save the baby, right? Manually displace the abdomen to the left during chest compressions, uh, provide good ventilations, and we'll do our very best to deliver, uh, get this baby delivered at a hospital. But we're going to treat it like any other cardiac arrest. So we're still using the same drugs, all that stuff. Nothing other than the displacement of the abdomen. There's not much that changes. Last but not least, it says normal landmarks for chest compressions may be difficult to find in a third trimester. Use the sternal notch as a guide for hand placement. Remember, we should be, the sternal notch is all the way up here. It starts to get maybe a little bit harder because remember all the organs are getting pushed up we still should be the lower half of the breastbone. Do not push too high up on the neck, but we should be able to note where the sternal notch is, and that should be able to assist us with noting how long typically somebody's uh, sternum is. Pregnant women are more susceptible to vomiting and aspiration during the resuscitation, so be mindful of that. Make sure we have suction readily available. So that's going to conclude this lecture on OB. 
my next lecture that I plan on bringing out is neonatal resuscitation. So as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Please continue to support this channel that helps it grow. And as always, good luck.